Hi everyone, I'm Michael Cooper, Director of Strategic Partnerships at Mental Health Research Canada. And I'm Dr. David Dozois, Professor of Psychology and Director of the Clinical Psychology Graduate Program at Western University. Today, we're talking to you about how COVID-19 is impacting mental health in Canada. We'll be looking at the results of our fifth national survey with Mental Health Research Canada. We wanted to talk to you about self-reported levels of anxiety and depression. In our last poll, we found one in four Canadians, 25%, were expressing high levels of anxiety, and 17% of Canadians were expressing high levels of depression. This is the highest we've seen yet. Uh, anxiety and depression really go hand in hand. If you experience one, you're very likely to experience the other. In fact, it's about 58% of the time that people who have one problem will experience the other. And anxiety is often a precursor to, de to depression. Anxiety is focused really on thoughts of upcoming threat, impending doom, uh, predictions about negative outcomes. And, you know, all of these things, I think it's, it's not surprising that anxiety increased during the pandemic, given all of these uh, aspects of, of anxiety. We all kind of want predictability and control and some degree of certainty into our lives. And COVID-19 has certainly thrown a curveball to all of this. Over time, I think helplessness turns into hopelessness, which is more associated with depression. Anxiety is all about uh, thoughts about the future and threat, whereas depression is more about past and loss. And the longer the pandemic has gone on, I think the harder it has been for uh, Canadians to stay connected with friends and loved ones, and the more people have felt lonely and isolated. And because of that, I think there's been a lot of, of grieving and loss, which is, which is probably increasing uh, the impact on depression. We also found um, when we looked at multiple variables, including how people manage stress, how they, how they were presenting with symptoms of mental distress, and how they feel about their resiliency, that we found about 6% of the population, which translates to about 1.8 million Canadians aged 18 and older, have all the indicators that we track in our work, um, including, as I mentioned, high anxiety, high depression, moderate to severe uh, mental health symptoms, low management of stress, and low resiliency. When we look at that 6%, we actually notice that it's about 60% female, and it's significantly younger with nearly half of that 6% entirely from that 18 to 34 age group. David, I think it's important that we collect information about resiliency and how people manage stress in our work. Can you tell us a little bit about how Canadians' uh, resiliency and uh, how they're managing stress through the pandemic? Sure, thanks, Michael. I think, uh, I think it's important first to remember that throughout the pandemic, many Canadians have been coping well. I think they've been staying pretty optimistic and and supporting each other well. I, I often think about the people who took pots and pans out, uh, you know, to celebrate and, and cheer on the healthcare workers at the end of their shifts, or people who've picked up groceries for loved ones and, and elderly people. I think Canadians have engaged in a lot of creative ways to connect meaningfully uh, with others. According to our fifth poll, uh, we found that 63% of Canadians felt confident in their ability to bounce back once the pandemic is over. And in order to stay healthy mentally, it is important to be resilient. Uh, psychologists define resilience as the ability to adaptively kind of bounce back, if you will, from adversity. And so I think it's that notion of bouncing back, um, but also finding personal growth in adversity. Um, it's, it's being able to problem solve. It's a, a mindset of optimism and confidence and seeing a difficult situation as a challenge rather than as a threat. I think that we've been through those before, we'll get through this as well. It's important to try to have a positive mindset. And I think it's also important to try to keep your resources high. I often think of, of stress like water in a jug. If the water level's too high, it just takes a little hit to make that splash all over the place. Uh, and if you can have the water level a little lower, the jug can take a hit and it'll slosh around, but it won't, uh, it won't spill all over the place. So some of the ways we can keep our water levels lower, our stress levels lower, is by uh, exercising, by getting out, by connecting with others meaningfully and in safe ways, um, by having a good sleep schedule, uh, by being aware of and, and careful about our drinking habits, and doing things that we find meaningful. We've noticed it's been relatively consistent that 18 to 34 year olds are both reporting higher levels of stress and anxiety, but also in our work, we're finding that they're reporting higher levels of symptoms of mental distress as well. 
David, is there anything you want to add in terms of uh, why youth might be reporting more anxiety and depression? Uh, sure. The, um, you know, I think these results are pretty consistent with uh, what we know about anxiety and depression pre-COVID. Uh, anxiety can occur at any age, but there's often sort of early uh, stages of anxiety with an onset of about, about 15 years. And then there's other anxiety disorders that tend to occur around uh, the early 20s to mid 30s. Um, with depression, it, depression can happen at any age, but the average age of onset is about early to mid uh, 20s. Although a lot of problems do occur prior to and around adolescence as well. So I think these findings are very consistent with what we see as the typical age of onset. Uh, as well, you know, the gender differences, when you mentioned um, finding females are more at risk, we tend to find that as well. For depression, for example, we know that females are about twice as likely to experience depression as males. And I think it's, you know, I think this age group is particularly vulnerable because this is a high vulnerable time. A lot of people are, you know, starting university or starting new jobs or getting married or trying to juggle uh, kids and teaching kids with their own jobs and their own mental health. And so I think they're, they're juggling a lot throughout this pandemic. You know, one thing I'm really proud of is that we've been tracking how Canadians, um, what activities Canadians are doing, which have uh, helped their mental health. So we asked them, um, you know, are you doing, how is this activity impacting your mental health? And since we've been asking that question, we have noted um, some significant changes in a lot of the activities, uh, especially between uh, April and August 2020. Um, but the one that's been relatively consistent and very high has been going outside, which actually held through the winter months as well. In fact, it went up during the winter months as well. So we've been encouraging Canadians to go outside to manage their mental health um, as one great activity. We've also noted uh, higher numbers in reading um, in terms of reading a good book. Uh, and we have seen some reasonable responses from entertainment. Although things like daily news and social media have had a net more negative impact than positive. David, could you speak a little bit about um, what else you think Canadians can do or why those factors are actually helping them? Yeah, I, I think there are a number of things that Canadians can do to uh, promote their mental health. Some of these are quite consistent with the findings from our poll. Um, the first thing I would recommend is just putting structure in your day. I think it's really important to stay active behaviorally. Um, it's very important for our mental health that we experience both pleasure and mastery or feelings of accomplishment. What often happens in depression is people start feeling uh, low motivation and low energy, and so they avoid doing things they normally would do. That just creates a downward spiral where they beat themselves up mentally, and then they do less and they feel less energy and less motivation. And what we want to do is turn that spiral the other way. We want to increase uh, activity toward things we enjoy and things that give us a sense of, of accomplishment. The second thing I'd recommend is keeping your thinking in check. I think it's really important that we think with facts, not emotions. It's so easy to think emotionally rather than with evidence. And um, I think that can go both ways. On one hand, I think we can um, be really anxious about the pandemic and, and see the risk as higher than it really is. And I think it's important to put that in check. But similarly, you see people on the other side who are a little nonchalant about it and letting their guard down too much. And I think it's really important to readjust and, and be evidence-based in our thinking that way. And then the third thing consistent with our poll results as well is I would encourage people to find uh, ways to, to connect socially in very active ways. Uh, engage in, in forms of social connection uh, despite social distancing uh, that contribute to our social relationships. We know that uh, isolation and loneliness is a huge risk factor for depression and anxiety and other psychological outcomes. So try to be active and go out of your way to um, prepare and, and go for a socially distanced walk or hike with someone, uh, connect with someone in an active way, playing games or having a good conversation uh, through FaceTime or Zoom. Find creative ways to connect with other people and that'll go a long way to helping our mental health as well. We do see that there's going to be an increased need in echo pandemic on mental health going forward. We wanna make sure that Canadians get the support and help they need. Um, both for uh, societal recovery, but also part of our economic recovery as well. Uh, and we're really excited on the investments people are making in mental health, um, provincial governments, federal governments across Canada, which will support Canadians both um, in person and with more innovative virtual options 
uh, which, which can help scale up the response that we need. David, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, just in terms of what, what I expect to see in the near future, I think, you know, I worry about what researchers are calling the echo pandemic and um, where we'll see a dramatic rise in mental health problems following the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I think we need to work together to protect and support each other. We also need to, um, you know, we need more resources. We need uh, increased access to psychologists and other mental health uh, professionals. Uh, during this time. I think we've, we've needed that prior to COVID. COVID's made that all the more apparent. Um, and the only other thing I would add is that, um, you know, if, if you're continuing to experience anxiety and depression or other mental health problems, and they're causing impairment and interfering with your life, your, your social life, your work life, your school life, it's important to, to get a referral to a psychologist or another uh, mental health professional. Uh, for care. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching today. And remember, you can click the link in the description to read the full report on how COVID-19 is impacting mental health in Canada. We're pleased to share those reports with you, including previous iterations, which go back to April 2020. So you know, we'll be continuing this work until March 2022. And we're happy to share with you more in the future. And in the next video, we'll be talking more in depth about the impact on younger Canadians. If you'd like to see that video and more, consider subscribing for notifications and updates.